everybody. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. I still see some people walking in, but you were here on time, and I think it's important to begin meetings on time. According to the Economist Intelligent Unit, democracy is in decline. Why is this? We heard earlier today, just a few, an hour or so ago, the world is a mess. And I'm sure that's a scholarly technical term, which might be an acronym for something. I'm not exactly sure what it is, but it's a mess. Should we be concerned? Where will the power, which was referenced today, migrate? Economic, political, social, human power. How many digital identities do you have? Do you care? How many do you know about? How many do you not know about? What is the role of technology in the evolution of the representat representative government governance, which we know as democracy, and covet? So we come to today's Gezda Dialogue theme. Can we bolster democracy through technologies? Welcome, my name is Chris Lubkamin. I have the privilege of being the head of the Strategic Foresight Hub at the ETH in Zurich, and I will be moderating this conversation. And we have an amazing panel who are gonna come up in just a few minutes. The arc of our hour and a half together is gonna be a video. Each of our guests are gonna give about a three minute presentation statement. We're gonna have a chat, and then you can ask questions of the panelists or make comments. I prefer questions and long comments. And then we're gonna come to a close on time. You ready? Oh, come on. <laughs> That's much better, thank you. All right, let's roll the video. Excellent. And so we begin our dialogue this afternoon. We have five guests, three of whom are here with us physically and two who are coming into us with Zoom. We have Micheline Anne-Marie Calme Rey of many names. I'm not quite sure I get them all right. A Swiss politician who served as a member of the Swiss Federal Council for 2003 to 11, head of the Department of Foreign Affairs during that time and was president of the Confederation 2007-2011. So welcome to you. We have Neva Elkin Koren, who is a professor of law at Tel Aviv University and faculty associate with the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard. She's studying AI, law, ethics, digital platforms, and intellectual property. Good enough? Yeah. All right, good. Whew, I got to check here with my lawyer right there. It's like Aaron Maniam, who is joining us from Singapore, is deputy secretary 
at the Ministry of Communication Information for Singapore, a public policy professional with a particular interest in planning, futures, technology governance, and the organization of complex systems, and he is also a poet. And we need to have our guests up front, if we can have them up here, please. And next is Agnes Calamard, who you, many of you also probably know, who's a French human rights activist, scholar, currently the Secretary General of Amnesty International. And her interests, when I was looking up, are incredibly varied, but a special focus on human rights, women's rights, international refugee mo movements, transparency, and accountability thereof. And last but not in no way least is Ninjira Sambuli, who is a Ken Kenyan researcher, writer, policy analyst, and strategist interested in and working on understanding the unfolding gendered impacts of ICT adaption on governance, media, entrepreneurship, and culture. I do you okay? Can you hear us? All right, here we go. Well, come on up to the stage, please, everybody. Let's give them a round of applause. Say welcome. Here we go. And I'm going to have to kind of not get in front of you, Aaron. So here we go. <laughs> Wonderful. There we go. I'm going to pull that there just so we've got there. Everyone else can see when they're going to ask a question. OK. So Madam, would you like to kick off for us? Democracy, technology, when we think of those two words together, what do you think about? We're going to need this. Here we go. Wait, I'm sorry. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am Swiss, and as a Swiss citizen, I can only say that um, I love democracy, <laughs> yep. that I think uh, technologies can help to reinvent democracy. And uh, you, perhaps you will excuse me, I just take the example of Switzerland as uh, uh, an inspiration to explain what I mean by reinventing democracy. In Switzerland, we have um, a very decentralized system, political system, and um, uh, next, uh, the judicial, the um, executive, and uh, the legislative power, we have a fourth uh, institutional power, uh, that is the people. The people in Switzerland have popular rights. And I vote three, four times a year, uh, besides elections, I vote. And um, I mean, this is a, a system that, uh, uh, with a referendum and initiative uh, right, that gives, it is a very open system. That means that everyone can put an initiative on the desk of the parliament and the government and propose something. I mean, uh, we have a votation about every subject in life <laughs> and people can express themselves. It is part of a decision-making process. It's not something different as a participation. Mm. It's part of a decision-making process. And this system is, is the instrument of this system, uh, what we call the Landsgemeinde. Landsgemeinde is a people's assembly gathering on the place of the village and voting uh, laws and uh, mm -hmm. etc. elections sometimes. And um, we also exert this popular rights through uh, normal votation to go to the poll or to go to vote by post or to vote by, in some canton, by electronic voting. And this system, I mean, could be an inspiration for, uh, <laughs> for the, at a global level, because the world today is facing global risks. I mean, pandemia, I mean, climate change, I mean, uh, um, immigration, poverty, inequalities, uh, human rights, etc., etc. And this, uh, this risk, cannot be, uh, so uh, it is difficult to face this risk at an international level where, where every state has a word to say, every authority has a word to say, can exert a veto right, and um, where the civil society, the economic world, uh, the academic world have no word to say, mm. can just 
some exert some influence, but mm. not take uh, part at the decision making process. So it it is missing an institution at the global level, at the global yeah. level, and technologies. Great. Um, can 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 replace this uh, can 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 be an inspiration to put at the global level to 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 con, con, to build at the international at the global level uh, some sort of people's assembly that means a digital uh, people's assembly gathering everyone from the academic field to the citizen field. Uh, uh, from the economic, uh, from companies to everyone could be, uh, and, and this could be at the first time uh, a forum for exchanging ideas, but yeah. could become and evolve on a real uh, decision making institution at the global level. And I mean, at the end, and finish with that, I think yep. Gesta would be a perfect place in order to think about this, because we have the technical uh, knowledge to yep. put that in place. We have the technical knowledge, but we have to, to have some cooperation in order to make this ID, ID being concrete, uh, concretized, and, and, and I mean, Gesta has a credibility to, to think about it and to make it real. That could be one of our projects we take away at the end of the day, at the end of this week. The Digital People's Assembly. Thank you very, very much. That's fantastic. And we want to move right next to you to Niva. Niva, could you give us some thoughts on democracy, technology, where does that make you go? So first of all, just to congratulate Switzerland for having such an inspiring uh, model of democracy. And I guess democracy means different thing in different countries. Yep. Um, I um, cannot resist just responding to the high hopes and also high fears that are associated with uh, technology, some, somewhat uh, hubris that we've heard also in the previous panel about, uh, you know, I don't think, and, and also in this uh, short uh, film that we were uh, watching, I don't think the decline of democracy is related to technology, and I don't see a solution to this decline in technology. Uh, what I see as a problem is that, and I think it is related to technological change, is the fact that there is a huge mismatch between the institutions that we have in liberal democracy nowadays uh, and the new technological changes. And so uh, when we think about liberal democracies, and again, they mean different things in different countries, I just learned that, uh, I think uh, we, we still have some things in common, and that is the idea that the um, uh, coercive power of the state and the government has to be restricted somehow. And we use different measures for that. So sometimes it's the assembly of the people and sometimes it's the separation of powers that they have. we have the legislator and we have the executive branch and we have a judicial review. Uh, and we have uh, legal, um, uh, the rule of law, the idea that uh, of uh, the principle of legality, that governments cannot do what they're not explicitly authorized to do, and that citizens are free to do whatever is not explicitly prohibited by law. And all of these principles uh, are faced now with new technologies that is cha challenging them. And one technology in particular, like just as an example of digital technology doing that is AI. And we think about governance by AI is unlike governance by people. Uh, and so in governance by AI, that, and we use AI for governance in predicting policing, we use AI in governance in assessing, uh, um, in, in court decisions where courts have to assess the risk of potential offenders. We use AI on digital platforms in social media to determine whether to filter or not to filter some type of content, whether something is misinformation or not, whether it is infringing copyright, whether it is inciting to terrorism, all of these decisions that used to be taken by, uh, used to be made by 
uh, judicial authorities used to be executed by the executive branch and used to be uh, actually decided by uh, uh, elected representatives, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, that would balance freedom of speech against national security or public safety or reputation or property rights. All of these decisions are now automatically made by algorithms that are not transparent, that are learning from data and therefore changing over time mm -hmm. and create a huge challenge for auditing and for um, uh, oversight. And that is actually the challenge that we are facing, especially when all of these systems are being developed and deployed by the private sector. Mm -hmm. And so we need to rely on them to hold on to the public uh, interests. Mm -hmm. Now, hmm. uh, we, we sort of... Um, designed some, there are some efforts to uh, address this problem, especially in Europe, but they should have uh, uh, providing a real uh, solution. Algorithms uh, cannot, we, we cannot, for instance, rely on appealing to court so that uh, if this machinery of filtering content uh, is addressed by quoting a particular decision or by Facebook oversight board. This is important for the people who were harmed by it and also for the public who were you know, uh, deprived of that important content and their freedom of speech. But generally speaking, this does not address what the machine will do in the next day or in the future. Mm. And so we need to reimagine more robust mechanisms that would allow us to address that. Thank you. That's fantastic. So especially um, thinking about this balance. You said the balance, rule of law, balance. And I think, um, Aaron, I'd like to come to you next, if you don't mind, in Singapore, because you there have walked a very interesting line between balance, information, misinformation, and how you assess that and what you think about that and how you do it. So technology, democracy, where does that take you? It takes us to quite interesting places, I think. Um, th thanks very much, first of all, for, for having me. Um, and uh, Chris, I wanted to respond, first of all, to your thing about, uh, your comment about MESS being an acronym. And I think it really could be, you know, M is misinformation, uh, E is the environmental crisis that we're in. Uh, the first S, I think, would refer to systems failure and the fact that many of our institutions are not measuring up to the demands that we're placing on them. Uh, and the other S, I think, would be, you know, societal splintering, uh, the fact that identity politics and, um, you know, the, the various forms and dimensions along which our identities uh, take place um, are rapidly fragmenting the societies that we're in. And a lot of this is linked, I think, to the fact that, tech, that the, the tech we're dealing with is amplifying some of these differences. So, so I, I do think MESS could be a great acronym to kind of unite our discussion today. But you, you asked where, where I... Aaron, I just say, uh, you're sure. brilliant. <laughs> you're absolutely brilliant. <laughs> this is wonderful. All right. So carry on with the mess. Let's, uh, let's unmess Thank the you. mess. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So well, just to unmess it, here's where I wanted to say I, I, I felt so much resonance with what Neva just said, uh, you know, in terms of the need for, for balance and, and dealing with the, the many, many tensions and polarities that, that are out there with tech. Because that, that's where I come from, you know, in, in the world that I live in, um, you know, in my ministry especially, we're thinking a lot about how we manage the upsides of tech, but at the same time, how do we also manage and regulate the inevitable downsides? And we don't want to overregulate because there are so many genuine upsides, but we also are rec recognize that if we leave the upsides simply to unfettered market forces, then we have some serious problems to deal with. So just some quick examples, right? On the economic front, there are wonderful jobs coming out of the digital space. There are some really interesting examples of generativity in data, where we're moving beyond traditional assumptions of, of economic scarcity. But we also are dealing with the fact that big tech has far more market power than any firms in the past might have had. Uh, we are worried about reliance um, you know, on, on specific firms and their products or their platforms and app stores, um, while at the same time we worry about the fact that standards in areas like AI and data need to be maintained, right? So there has to be that, that constant polarity and, and balancing between the economic upsides and the need for regulation of the economic downsides. Similarly with socio-political issues, right? On the one hand, I think tech is giving us the opportunity to connect, collaborate, and be creative in more fundamental ways than we, we've ever had before. Um, and these are where I think the examples of free speech can be so powerly, powerfully felt um, if, if used well. But at the same time, you know, we, we 
there are huge risks in the socio-political sphere as well, right? Um, overconsumption um, or, or just overconsumption either of data or overconsumption on specific platforms where you know, people become reduced to mere automatons, um, you know, playing with their digital devices. Uh, the potential for conflict is very real, exacerbated by the speed, scale, volume and velocity uh, of information um, that's flowing out there. Um, there's the risk of misinformation and disinformation, of course, as I mentioned earlier in, in the acronym MESS. Uh, and there's a huge risk of harmful content as well, right? There's content out there that is wonderful and creative and collaborative. And a lot of stuff out there that I wouldn't want children to be exposed to, that are exposed to suicide ideation, uh, you know, and that might involve illicit use of, uh, of intimate pictures by unknowing minors. I think all of these are issues that require significant amounts of not just collaboration uh, uh, between the state and, and tech firms, Firms. We also need to ensure that states themselves set in place the right rules and structures within which uh, firms can, can actually regulate their behavior. Mm. And I haven't even started on the risks of cyber threats and, and other you know, important incursions on security. But that, I think, again, can be a source of deep distress. But if done right, technology can actually help us to solve some of those problems, uh, particularly, I think, if we harness the potential of quantum encryption uh, and some of the, the, the work that's happening in the, the more you know, forward-leaning fields of, of physics. So the big summary I would have really is that amidst all of this mess, we have got to rise up to this challenge of dealing with the tensions and polarities out there. Um, and, and it'll be a very difficult task, a very delicate balance to have to strike. But Neva's absolutely right that we have to work at achieving that balance. Mm. Thanks. Aaron, thank you very much. That's a perfect segue. Talking about balance, freedom, free speech. What does this mean? Agnes, I think this is something, when you think of technology, democracy, where does that take you? Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be, uh, to be here. Um, so for Amnesty International, of course, technology is a double-edged sword. Uh, on one hand, we see its benefits around the world. I mean, we just have to think about Iran. Right now, we see its benefits in terms of people getting organized, in terms of people uh, being able to circulate information. Um, we see that in the, in the Me Too movement, which was very much driven uh, and amplified through digital technology, the Black Lives movement, which became a global movement, largely thanks to digital uh, technology uh, and to, um, to the fact that there was a cell phone recording at the beginning of the BLM. Um, we see the benefits of technology in the future in uh, Web3, uh, in uh, decentralized autonomous organization, DAO, which uh, we are as an organization, I'm certainly very keen for us to explore that as a form of governance, which may be able to escape uh, the scrutiny of um, governments in places where we are no longer able to, to be, such as uh, China. I'm not even talking to operate, but just to be. Mm. Um, so I think both currently and with what's coming up through... Um, blockchain, DAO, and Web3, to mention just a few, there are huge uh, potentials and opportunities currently and in the future. But it is also something that can be employed just for the opposite mm. of empowerment. Mm. It can be employed for repression. And there, the miracle of digital technology turns into a nightmare. We just need to think uh, of um, surveillance, uh, I, uh, before joining Amnesty, worked on the um, killings of uh, the Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi. And um, that killing was certainly at heart, uh, or at the beginning at least, prompted, driven through, tr through surveillance. Not only surveillance, but surveillance that was transnational. In other words, governments use surveillance to act illegally on the territory of another country. Mm. Something that, you know, I mean, we are seeing aggression right now of a scale that we haven't seen in a very long time in, in Ukraine with uh, the devastation that we are seeing. So it's a much smaller form of aggression. But internationally, legally speaking, you can see that as a form of aggression. But you see, you are much more aware of surveillance being 
directed at the people of uh, a government. So China is certainly uh, a place where we have done extensive work as an organization. Uh, we have documented a sophisticated surveillance system against the Uyghur uh, as part of a crimes against humanity. So, you know, atrocity driving, driven by uh, technology. Uh, and we are also seeing that uh, extended to the entire Chinese population through mass surveillance projects such as Skynet and Sharp Eyes. We've already heard from the previous speaker about the fact that um, this is a technology that is essentially private. It's privately owned, it's privately designed, it's privately uh, controlled, and it's privately um, uh, I will say, directed, yeah. and it's a money-making enterprise. For, so for all those reasons, we certainly have noted that those, technolo those uh, companies have a major role to play and are playing a major role in the use, the abusive uh, use of technology. And the, 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 the last case we worked on are the, the Rohingyas in, in Myanmar, uh, where... Uh, Facebook uh, has played a, a key role, not Facebook, but the people using Facebook. And that's how I want to end. Mm. Um, of course, digital technologies can bolster either democracy or repression through their inherent capacities, you know, scale, global spread, community building, and so on. But they can empower people to know their right or they can manufacture ignorance as we have seen mm. plenty of that over the last few years. But the outcome of the ex existentialist fight for the soul of our societies is not with the technology. And I will say it's, oh, yes, it is with the companies, but it is with us. Mm. It is people, you know. Yes, they have inherent characteristics that make them more akin to be used or misused. But at heart, it is also about people, is how they are organizing it, how they are planning around it. When we talk about troll factories, you know, these are commissioned, these are organized, these are set by very people, very, very physical people in, in our analog world. So it is who uses the technology, who control them, who regulate them, who makes money out of them. These are the ones that we need to focus on. And I'm going to end with you know, four things I think that we need. We need new institutions that are adapted to the technology, and I will certainly agree with that. We need norms, a normative framework that understands where technology is driving us. This is a revolution. And we do not have an ex an, a similar normative revolution taking place. So there are too many gaps there. We need changing behaviors adapted to that new revolution, and we need the law, international law in particular, to adapt to what is a transnational global phenomena for which international law is very misadapted, very badly adapted, and that needs changing too. Thank you. So was it, what was the fourth? I'm sorry. I miss international law. International law. Okay, Greta, thank you. International. I have to write really fast. You gave me things to write down. Okay. Thank you, Agnes. And now that's a great segue because we, we, topped, we started with uh, the Swiss democracy and the direct democracy, which you shared with us in that experience. And now our last input here that will be from Nanjira from Kenya. And there's a case from technology and democracy from another end of the northern hemisphere, southern hemisphere. So tell us when these two words come to you, what, do you, what does that make you think about? Well, the way the, 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 the session is titled, I think that the first response is terms and conditions apply. Um, and then you can break the question down to can we bolster democracy, period, and then maybe ask a secondary question, if and how technology can help achieve that. That uh, helps us under, uh, you know, come to different or similar conclusions by looking at different ways that these issues are intersecting. So, you know... Let me use the example of Kenya. We just come off an election, and um, Kenya has had an interesting, uh, been an experiment in the last decade on how to use technologies through election seasons to bolster said democracy, civic participation, and transparency, and all of that. Um, each 
election cycle, it has been um, an interesting case of lessons learned on what works and what doesn't. And I think the point has already been made that at the end of the day, you can have the best technology, the most expensive technology, for example, but the intrinsic motivation is what matters here. And I think we have to always keep that as a North Star in how we talk about the role of the technologies in society today. Um, technologies will help if the intrinsic motivation is to actually fix something. They will also similarly not help if the motivation is to control or to suppress and so on and so forth. Then you have also more what you might call some more practical issues about who actually has the access to these technologies to engage um, in, you know, bolstering democracy. In Kenya, for example, over the 10 years, I could say um, people have exercised through the use of social media um, the democratic rights that have been enshrined in a new constitution, some of which they cannot exercise offline. So, for example, um, it's increasingly possible if you're online connected and discussing an issue to have sort of protest and register protest that may be taken upon um, action upon by um, authorities. But if you go to the streets to exercise your right to protest, you could die. So you start to see that dual nature that starts to emerge about the unfinished business of democracy, meeting the emerging and unfolding impacts of technology. Then you also have, when you focus on the technology side, the fact that these technologies are net, we're net importers of technology in many parts of the world. So to Agnes's point about like who's designing, who has access and agency to shape um, the norms or the structural elements to these technologies um, does create an important issue to feature in uh, tech governance discussions, even at a global level, about what happens to markets that are not even able to hold companies like Meta to account, you know, in their jurisdictions. What kinds of rules make it possible or what kinds of processes make it possible for harms that are localized to be, uh, you know, to place actors who have inadvertently not address them uh, when warned to be held accountable to that. So that brings an interesting case right now that's ongoing in Kenya where um, the Employment and Labor Relations Court is trying to hear whether they can actually, uh, you know, bring Meta to book through Kenyan law for content moderation practices and a case that has been brought um, against them. So you see all these things intersecting to make it that we must be very careful in the discourses and the way we shape the conversation in a so-called international global setting to really accommodate the diversity of experiences on how we are arriving at both the two things, the democracy front and the technology front, to humble us in our assumptions and also in creating intersectional approaches to make sure that we do not, through our endeavors, create more harms in a world that where people are really still dealing with such urgent bread and butter issues. It's really ironic in an age as advanced as ours, we still have to talk about some basics whilst, you know, uh, at one time blockchain and hunger are at the same table um, for the agenda. So this creates some real politic um, dimensions that we must always keep in mind. And lastly, I think I'll close by saying that but by so doing so, by making sure it's not just about picking or cherry picking examples from a few countries, say, you know, I, favorite phrases, India is the world's largest democracy. Um, and then when convenient, we overlook how real harms are coming in based on that, because we want to bolster the fact that there's a democracy from the South, due to the use of technology, where it has led to catastrophic failure, even if there have been massive investments. So we need to find a way to bring humility to have a conversation about how complicated all this. And I think just that presents us an interesting platform to do so. Thank you. Thank you so much. And that's also a wonderful reality check, as you're saying. I mean, as you just said, the right to protest is given, but if you go to the street, you have a good chance of getting killed, but you can do it online and you've got a chance to live to another day. That's a very sobering reality check for, I think, for all of us. Um, I wanna, and it brings us to this question of democracy, various types of democracy and technology. So we talked, I think almost all of you, maybe not, I can't remember, mentioned in some, some way is democracy evolving with this new technology, with the new opportunities with technology? And now that everyone, almost everyone, almost everyone has a cell phone, that's a new way to express an opinion. So are we still keeping up with technology? Because this is something you mentioned, Neva, Aaron, you mentioned that. What do you think? What does it make you think about? I think that um, you know it's, that you know some of us have mentioned motivation and the way in which technology could be used for uh, various purposes. It's it's almost trivial that we all mention this, um, and I think that where the challenge is is to look at the way we structure incentives for individuals, for companies, 
for governments to do the right thing. Now, of course, uh, we, uh, I mean, you talked about international treaties. Um, we probably don't disagree what the right thing is. You mentioned China, you mentioned Russia. Uh, we have different views uh, globally. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that uh, we need to, you know, when we, when we think about uh, technology, that is probably going to first take place at national laws, deciding these balances, you know, by people. And I think that is where it is important to understand what technology, what are the affordances technology can provide and what are the risks that are involved in this technology so that people can decide what to do with it, how to use it, and what type of incentives we want to uh, create for the companies that are developing it. But that brings up a question of, you know, can, can the people decide? And this is a top, um, towards all of you, if, if we have blockchain, we have all these things, can, what does this mean from this issue of literacy? Can, can people decide now? Of course. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, what are we talking about? We are now, I so talking, I talked about um, uh, democracy could be, uh, could, could, could have an impulse from, through new technology. But I heard the other uh, people mm -hmm. say statements and uh, um, I, I just remarked that we are talking about, uh, about uh, internet, about the democratization of private internet. And that's something different as uh, democracy through exercing democracy through digital platform or through digital instrument. That's something different. That, that would be a public platform and not a private one. So I agree that we have, we know today some problems mm. with the social media yeah. and we have some needs to control. We have some needs for norms. We have some needs for law about the use of social media. We have some needs of a framework to encadre this social media. I agree with that because they, they have some risk. The risk, for example, that struck me is the risk of uh, being governed by algorithm. Uh, I mean by program. And we all have seen that by the pandemic. We were all governed by um, statistics by uh, rates of, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know what, <laughs> and, and you know. By graphs. The you also but graphs yeah. There were not politicians so, who decided, but there were algorithms and there were there was programs mm -hmm. and not people and not law and not parliament. And that's a difficult, well, we, live, we are living in a difficult time. Mm -hmm. but, my, but, but this time has also some advantages. You mentioned Iran. Uh, I mean, people can gather and can express themselves through the mobilization, through social media. And uh, they disturb the government at the point that uh, they will uh, close the access to internet. So you see, it can also have some advantages. But my purpose was to, to bring an alternative to this system of so private social media, to bring an alter alternative in terms of a public platform, digital platform, where people, people, academic uh, sector, everyone could take part, exchange, and perhaps uh, organize a decision-making process that allow people to decide, but it will be an ultimate state, not the first one. <laughs> but, I mean, technically, okay. it is possible, and it would be yeah. an alternative to this private uh, democratization of internet that brings problems. So, voila. Uh, and I'm very much convinced that people can decide, really can decide, and have to decide in order to be engaged in public life. Okay. Other views? Who has, who has, uh, thank you. Go ahead, Agnes. Um, I think you're, 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 you're describing what Web3 is supposed to be, which is a completely mm -hmm. decentralized system. Um, and that's a, the lovely part of it. But of course, 
Okay. okay. Um, but of course, there is a darker part of it. Um, you know, uh, I remember because I came, f I, I, I'm coming from a freedom of expression background. I've, I've worked in that field for a very long time. And at the beginning of internet, uh, we are talking 20 years ago, that's how, well, it was not the beginning, but the beginning of Web2. My colleagues and even I were saying, wow, we're going to see a complete democratization of voices. You know, we're going to see the demise of those uh, media uh, empires that are driving what we see, what we read, mm -hmm. controlling everything. But, you know, 20 years later, what do we say? Well, there may have been some good in having a much more hierarchical, regulated, controlled system. Mm. Anarchy, the anarchy of the internet is not necessarily a driver for more voices or more empowerment or more democracy. It is not. We need to, we need to face that fact. So the, the, what Web3 can offer us could really be Another nightmare, the immutability, at least so far, in the design of it, I have some doubt, I think we can tackle that, but the immutability of Web3 uh, is a threat, is a threat if the content is highly dangerous, highly hateful, you know, uh, child pornography and so on and so forth. So, you know, it's really about how uh, we as a society are prepared to look at the technology now and in the future and what kind of regulatory framework we are prepared to imagine yeah. because it may not be here. Um, and, and yes, you know, international law is not there yet, but that's why we need to put that as a priority. It is not appropriate that in 2022, whenever we speak about, you know, those across national global phenomena, the international lawyers run away, you know, because of, you know, sovereignty, national jurisdiction, blah, 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 and inherent qualities of the law. I'm sorry. It's not. It's. It's just not acceptable that lawyers are being formed and trained right now that do not try to imagine an international legal system that can comprehend, that can make sense, that can regulate, that yep. can empower those global phenomena. We have a Excellent. gap. So this is part of the anticipatory, it's not just positive, but it's negative, trying to think what we need to evolve. So you're putting that on the table. We need to evolve rules, regulations, legal structures, also individuals who can deal with it. I think this is really great. This is what Jezda is trying to evoke, exactly that. And I saw three heads bouncing back up and forth at the beginning of your, of your um, interjection. And I want to start with Aaron over here, then we go to Nick. Aaron, what did that make you, how, your response to that? Yeah, no, I, I love what Agnes was saying uh, because I think there are two major responses, right, that we should, we need to, to I like to build on there at least. One is that I fully agree on what law needs to do, but I don't think keeping up with technology via any single piece of totalizing legislation is going to be realistic. What we need, right, is lawyers who can keep accreting and gradually iterating the, the, the laws that we have more and more so that we keep adjusting to the changes in the tech. Because today's tech is going to be very different from what we see in probably even six months to even 12 months time, right? So in Singapore, we've got a separate set of laws dealing with falsehoods, a different law dealing with foreign interference issues and disinformation, a separate set of laws dealing with harassment. Uh, we're about, we, we hope to, to take to parliament in the next uh, few weeks, a set of laws on online safety around you know, the issues of, of, of uh, harmful issues like suicide ideation and illicit use of, of intimate um, material that we, that we have to deal with separately, I think, from issues around misinformation and, and disinformation. And I think we need to take this sort of polycentric, iterative approach. You know, you mentioned earlier, Chris, that I'm interested in the study of complex systems, right? Um, I am. And one of the most important things that we realize when dealing with complex systems is that we need experimental, iterative, constant beta testing 
rather than trying to find a single silver bullet or a single totalizing answer yeah. to, to particular problems. So that's one aspect. The other quick thought that I quickly wanted to share is I do think we, there has to be a place for public education and awareness building in this whole process. Regulation by itself will be brittle, right? And we, we, we render it less brittle if we have a citizenry that is also equipped with the instincts and the ability to discern what is useful versus what is not useful in the online space. Now, this makes many assumptions as well, right? We, this requires fundamental access, first of all, to the digital space. It requires awareness and skill building. It requires access to both hardware and connectivity, and then the right sorts of habits of mind to navigate this space. Not easy to do, but it means that both school curricula, as well as the ways in which we educate people in the workforce, and more generically, has to keep evolving. And in Singapore, we don't stop doing that. Right? We've tried to do this uh, with both very young kids, as well as older Singaporeans, because all of them are playing in the digital space and we need to make sure that they have that right level of awareness to complement the legal infrastructure that we agree is an equal and important part of this process. That's great. Thank you. Ninjira, I'm going to come over to you. Your head was bopping up and down as well. So what were you thinking? I, I was actually thinking about the role of anticipation here. And you rightfully pointed out that we have to be very clear for that to also be a space where we anticipate the negatives. I was going to reinforce that and say it should also be an anticipation that is truly global in its outlook and actually intersectional in its approach. In that through the, the experiments of forays with technology and democracy, oftentimes uh, developing countries, and especially in Africa, have always been the canary in the coal mine. They've been a lot of times the test bed of what could go wrong. Ten years ago, I used to work on online hate speech. When we approached the big platforms about this being an issue we're seeing based on our political economy, we were, we were ignored and the grants would go to Western scholars. Now today it's in vogue and it's almost like everybody's discovering something that we've been talking about for a long time. In the governance space and in the diplomacy space, we're going to have to do this differently. Um, because, again, with a rush to capture the new, market, uh, new markets that are emerging uh, to assert dominance or whatever other incentives are driving the private sector-driven adoption of technology, Africa, uh, Latin America, Southeast Asia become the new for, for raise for many of these platforms. And a lot of experimentation is going to be happening at the expense of, you know, real authentic ways of doing, including local innovation that is grounded in realities. Mm. So anticipating that in, in the way we talk about these conversations and how we evolve our conversations about the role of technology in society, democracies and so on is going to be absolutely critical for us to create any solutions or pathways that feel global and representative of the different corners of the world where technologies are diffusing in different uh, you know, realities. That's great. Thank you. This is excellent. Now it's time to turn to you. And how many of you have a question? I see one way in the back, one here, one here. And I'm going to take one of these microphones right here, if I may, because we still have one here. I'm going to walk up and I'm going to take two questions. So go ahead. Thank you. Very interesting conversation. I really appreciate it. And I love the fact that there are so many women there. <laughs> My question uh, reflects, um, I'm a computer scientist. I've studied AI 40 years ago already. And uh, technology is as good as the people who are uh, developing it, uh, which means that uh, the technology that we're using um, is a direct reflection of the mindset of the programmer, respectively, the company that is developing the technology. And what does it mean, the values? Whose values do we want to implement into law? Is it an egocentric? Is it America first, Trumpian? Uh, or is it an ethnocentric mindset? Or is it a world-centric mindset? Because we see that our planet is going down the tubes. Mm -hmm. And so that's the question to you, like, how can we make that happen? Thank you. Great. Okay, so Can I respond? go for that, yeah. So uh, this is a great question. I think uh, that um, computer scientists and engineers in general, data scientists, have an important role in this uh, arena. Uh, and I think that we need to, you know, pe we, we've just uh, mentioned a couple of times the word education, and I think that a lot of effort should be put on developing tools for responsible AI. That is not just awareness of the values, but also of the processes and institutions by which these values are going to be decided. Having said that, I think that uh, it's it might be sometimes an exaggeration to say that technology reflects the values of those who develop it. And the reason is 
that sometimes technology has unintended consequences. And people design technology for one thing, to protect uh, against surveillance and market forces. And the use by people may change its meaning. It is interpreted by social institutions. Yeah. So we need Great. to think about technology as something that is embedded in society. And sometimes the very good intentions could actually end up being uh, uh, yeah. right. Great, thank you. Did, does, did someone else want to say something really, really short? Go ahead. Ninja. Oh, yes, thank you. I was yeah. just going to say, I think that the question of ethics and principles since it's become de jour is a particularly interesting one. And if we're not careful, becomes an exercise in navel gazing in the sense that um, the biggest aspect of education, as we're talking about here, is humility to ask whether you're the computer scientist or the diplomat designing or the policymaker, what does sustainability mean in your context? What does fairness mean in the context where you're going to be deployed. I think that approach to these conversations about principles and ethics is going to get us to something that is more grounded in reality than just, you know, vacuous exercises in trying to figure out the top nine, which will be interpreted differently in different spheres. So I think that's something if we emphasize whether it's for product developers, uh, diplomats, you know, policymakers alike, then we may uh, even change the kinds of conversations we're able to have around how all these come together in reality. Okay, um, can I go to the next question? Okay, next question right here. Go ahead. Thank you. Well, when, when one speaks about uh, new technologies, usually people talk about the risks and uh, the risk of uh, accepting them or endorsing them, and they never look at the risk of not endorsing them. Hmm. And I think that's a, a relevant question in my mind uh, when it comes to technologies and especially when it comes to the technicalities, uh, technicalities of, uh, of voting. I mean, I, I'm also mm -hmm. Swiss. I'm sure that people can get inspired, but not everything that we do in Switzerland is good. And I, I used to live in Belgium where for 20 years people have been voting by ticking on a screen uh, without using a pen and a piece of paper and sending it through the post to uh, to the uh, uh, commune uh, administration. Mm. So the question is, how about the cost of not endorsing, not embracing new technologies? Okay, who would like who would like to go for that one? It's, uh, I'm thinking from a democracy standpoint. Does that anyone does that evoke a response to anybody? Yeah, I can do that. Go <laughs> a, a short response on that short one. Short response is again. You know, I think this is like, for instance, the European. Um, AI Act has an assumption that there are some technologies that should be prohibited because you can anticipate for sure the risk. And I think that that is, should be questionable, at least uh, by both scientists, um, you know, like real, you know, hard side, the, the, the exact scientists and, and social scientists, because uh, facial recognition, well, it's bad when it is used in a bad way. It's good when it protects people in the Ukraine against uh, a rape in the woods, right? And so I think that to outlaw technology is, is really, really risky. And, and, and I would actually hesitate um, uh, to do that. Um, just it's part of human nature to sort of engage in uh, an attempt to provide some progress. Excellent, excellent question. Go ahead. I, I, I would say uh, there is no option. I mean, uh, okay, technologies are there. They are used by people for good or, or worse, but, but we have them. And not using them is in, in utopia. <laughs> I mean, it won't happen. We use them, so we have to deal with them. Today, by regulation, education, uh, everything you want, international law, etc. Um, but you have also to imagine how you can make the democracy better or larger or wider with new technologies. And you evoke the electronic vote, okay. It is beginning in Switzerland, okay. And it allows, yeah, very slowly because for security reasons, but it evolves and I think we will have it in some years and it will allow people Swiss people living abroad to give their advice, to participate in voting. And um, I, I think it's a, we have to use it publicly. I mean, the political leaders have to engage themselves about technologies. The problem is that nobody understands 
on what are the, the challenges of new technologies in the governments and in the well, public leaders are not, you know, I'm not a specialist, I'm not a scientist, and I, I, I expect that uh, a lot of political uh, deci decision makers don't, don't really, n are not scientists, don't really see the challenges. And so you have a problem there. <laughs> Perhaps with the young generation, it will something be, uh, else, be uh, something else. But, uh, but I mean, uh, we have, not, we shouldn't think of not using technologies. We should think on how to do it better, how to, yeah. do, to use okay. it uh, for the good of democracy. Great, thank you. Aaron, you want to pitch in the new as well? So, boom, boom, go. Sure. Great. I'll keep it very quick, uh, yep. Chris. Just two points on this. One is to say I fully agree with the idea that we should be really discerning about when we want to use technology and when we don't, and be extremely precise. Uh, so just to give an example, when I think about with my brothers, uh, you know, how he wants to have his kids right, uh, use more and more tech, we're very clear that if the tech enables connection or collaboration, that's a good thing. If it enables creativity, great. If it encourages mindless consumption that leads to mental health issues, no. And if it is, if it leads to conflict, clearly no. So I think we need that level of precision to, to make us quite clear right, about where exactly the tech is going to have good effects and when it doesn't, and then have the courage and the discernment to say we will not use it in certain circumstances. Uh, second, very quick point, this is why I changed my backdrop, actually. Um, I... I think we need to remember that we will not have to use technology all the time, right? It is okay for us to want to use it most of the time for the purposes that I mentioned, but that sometimes it is also okay to pull away and to decompress and to detox. Um, so my own version of that is to come to this place that's on my backdrop now, right? It's, a, it's a part of the Big Sur coast in, in the US, a little Benedictine monastery where I go spend time. And the best thing about them is that they don't tell me their internet password. So I cannot use any kind of online connection for a week. Um, but, but that's a conscious choice because I think it makes me better when I then come back into the community that I belong to, both online as well as physical. So I think we can make some conscious choices there and it's probably useful for our long-term um, collective as well as individual mental health. Thank Thanks. You. Thank you very much, Aaron. Also, when we think about anticipating impact, right? This is what the <laughs> anticipator is about. How is it going to impact? Last in interjection on this question. Yeah, there, there are technological development that I believe are inherently bad, inherently bad for, for us. Uh, and we should be prepared not to develop them. I'm thinking here of certain type of weapons. Uh, I'm thinking here of a, a weapon that actually has not has been prohibited at the design stage, which was meant to blind soldiers. It has been agreed we are not going to develop, we are not going to design that kind of weapon, even though it was possible um, at, to even ups, upscale it. Um, there are some um, inherently, I think, extraordinarily uh, dangerous um, uh, implications of bioweapons, of those kind of weapons that can target ethnic groups, that can, you know, so what are we, you know, we should be prepared to confront the fact that not everything that we want to develop or design um, should be designed or developed. Uh, and, I, I, you know, we need intervention at a, at a much earlier stage than um, reaching the, the risk of having those things around us. I think, again, I come back to what Jez does about, is trying to anticipate some of these things for an, far in advance, the 5, 10, 25, 30-year time frame. What can, what can we do? We have one more question here, way, way, way in the back. And then uh, we're coming close to the time. Thank you so much, uh, Stefan German, Fondation Botnar. An essential element of democracy and good governance is something that's very unpopular, that's taxation. <laughs> Why are we not talking about data taxation as much as we should? Because probably if we really would go into this issue of data taxation, a number of these issues of big tech who have set themselves above good governance and democracy and have a self-proclaimed space, semi-godlike, would probably change through taxation. Now that is an interesting concept. Go ahead, Ninja. <laughs> I, uh, you can always count on Stefan to come with a provocative question. Um, let me, practically speaking, I think ideally 
we're seeing some variations of uh, data localization laws in developing countries being misinterpreted yet that's exactly what they're trying to institute in some form. So you have situations where uh, investments, uh, whether through public-private partnership or um, you know, governments lobbying on behalf of their companies to invest in digital transformation plans, suppressing any calls by certain governments, and especially in the developing world, where they want data stored locally for them to first appropriate benefits and then sort of transfer across borders. So these tensions are emerging in that regard because the power dy dynamics are coloring how technology is advancing have not separated themselves from um, all these other things we're talking about. And especially where um, digital development for developing regions and emerging markets is, 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 is involved, the politics of extraction, the politics of, uh, you've heard the term of colonialism being brought in as far as digitalization go, some of those dynamics are still very real and present. So it actually would flip the question and say, as we think about that as a model, and I'm sure we'll see fancy proposals brought up anytime soon, rather than start with the Europe and the you know American experience, take a Kenya, take an India and see how that informs how we build what we understand as a global uh, solution to this challenge. Very interesting. I saw a few heads going up and down on that one as well. We're coming close to the end. Yeah, just short, one word about short. taxation, because there was a question on taxation. Taxation is already done through uh, electronic and, and digital uh, instruments. I mean, uh, also simulation of taxation of people are doing through new technologies. And uh, you're right, it changes uh, the view we have on taxation by give it, giving the, the political leaders data, uh, on real data on what is going on in the population, who is earning that and who is, uh, um, who is uh, whose income is uh, in which category, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This, is, this is already done. The last word I would say, is uh, that we are talking about democratization of private internet, social media, and that brings some consequences and some negative consequences. I, I suggest as, as another option to build, to construct a digital platform, a public digital one, used by everyone from, um, from the, the citizens to the, to the academic uh, world, to the, to the, to the companies, etc., in order to have some other sounding board, I mean, uh, expressing the will of citizens and, and, and other civil societies and uh, could have an influence on the decision-making process or perhaps someday uh, taking part in the decision-making process because this is another way of using new technologies. It's not only repairing the private democratization of internet and, and, and repairing the, the negative impacts, but also creating something that has positive impacts and, exp and, some, and widen democracy and uh, allow people to express themselves. Okay, thank you very much. So this is now the last. Um, I know there are more questions in the room, and I'm sorry we couldn't get to them. They'll still be here for a few minutes afterwards. You're very, very welcome to come up, unless you absolutely wanted to make sure everyone heard your question. You can ask somebody here. <laughs> Two different types of questions, we know that. Um, I would like to ask those who would like to share an idea as a closing thought. What would you like someone in this room to do on Monday? When we're thinking about technology and democracy, what would you ask of anyone in the room? And it is not a mandatory request, it's an offer. And I'm gonna start with Nanjira. You were up there, you were last before, so you're gonna go first this time. If you have Boy, one. thanks. Yes, of course, Chris. I wish I could do <laughs> a poll of the room. I wish I could do a poll of the room to find out uh, people's top three new sources in technology. I would encourage everyone, actually, it doesn't even need to be Monday this evening, start to discover uh, tech sites talking about what's happening beyond the world. So one example is Rest of World that really gives you insights very different from how New York Times and all these other, you know, actual typical newsletters outlets talk about what's happening with technology in our societies and especially in the global south. And that was, can you reference that again, please? Rest of world. Rest of world. Yeah, right. dot org. 
Not, it's yeah. not spelled in some very interesting way. It's R E S D. No, just as you say it. Okay. Well, you never know. I mean, you know, if you're in <laughs> exactly. Wales, you never know. Or in Finland, you've got, it's a mind bending experience to try to spell something. Okay. Um, who else has something they'd like to, for us to do on Monday? Um, actually, I'm going to ask people to think about something. Um, in 1947, the German um, philologist, it's a, the science of language, wrote, and I quote, it is not only Nazi actions that have to vanish, but also the Nazi cast of mind, the typical Nazi way of thinking, mm. and its breeding ground, mm. the language of Nazism. I want us to think about what is the language of Nazism in 2022, in our networked communities and societies. How are we to respond to his warning? What are the language of atrocities, of Nazism um, mm. in 2022 and, and right. beyond? Do we understand how they spread, how they circulate, how they take hold mm. so that major crimes against people no longer feel unthinkable and then are acted upon. Hmm. I want us to think about that question on Monday. Thank you. Thanks, Agnes. Rest of the world, think about the language of Nazism. Um, it's hard to uh, contribute to anything after such inspiring <laughs> uh, thoughts. Um, but reluctantly, I'll bring us back to earth. Um, in, in policy and law, I would think that policy should focus on uh, creating incentives, by the way, through taxation as well, for developing algorithms that are focused on the public interest. And so uh, I think that algorithms could be used in order to audit um, AI systems, algorithms could be used in order to inform citizens. They can create more transparency. They could help. What, what, what uh, should we do? Hmm? What should we do in this room? What? That's the question to you. What should we do in this room? The well, in this room, the, yes. I think that there are some lawyers here. There are some uh, developers here that can actually develop these type of technologies um, and, and think about you know, their own uh, responsibility in, in promoting this or pressuring their representatives to do that. Uh, uh, through the law, but I think that developing Great. this type of technology that would enable people to safeguard their uh, civil rights, the old civil rights, mm. uh, I think um, uh, that would be uh, an urgent um, um, project for Great. all of us. On wonderful, Monday. yeah, wonderful. Thank you. Three excellent ones. Uh, so I would be happy if uh, everybody in this room could take place in a people's assembly, <laughs> <laughs> a sort of, uh, of Landsgemeinde, uh, yeah. in order to be uh, able to debate on the question uh, that was given to you before, and um, in order to allow the lawyers participating in this uh, assembly to present a program <laughs> in order, to, in order to, to explain how to... To, uh, to to respond to the risk of the of the and to, and to 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 propose some law. So okay, that's great. Thank you. Excellent. And last but not least, Aaron. I don't know if this is going to sound slightly kooky, uh, Chris, but I am going to say that I I think the first thing we should do, maybe not even on Monday, but today, right, is to just go take a walk outside, um, get away from the technology for a while, um, and remember that it is not the be all and end all of our existence. It really isn't everything. Um, walk in nature, breathe in the air of trees, and and you know inhale and exhale with them. Um, I realize that this is not the most expected thing you'd, you'd want or maybe even have, have anticipated in a panel about tech and democracy. But I think we need to remember that whatever we do is nested in this much larger set of, of interlocking systems. Uh, and the more we remember that there is a larger system out there, I think the more appropriate we can be about how we, you know, we contextualize the tech. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that would be my That's tip. Great. Thanks. 
you're getting applause here if you didn't. If, so, I mean, th thinking that we're a part of a bigger system, thank you very much, all of you. That was a really mm -hmm. beautiful way to end. I think the couple quotes which I really found resonated with me when one said, regulation alone is very brittle. It can break quickly. And how do we need to make sure that we are learning and helping others learn so that we're not afraid, but we look at them, these challenges with open eyes. I think this is something I take away also from all of you is looking at things with positive and negative. And the other thing I have to really think more about is are the polarities with which not all of you, but many of you spoke about the polarities that this question, this issue has in many, many manifestations. And so these are the things. So I thank you for that very much. And I've learned a lot. So thank all of you so much for choosing to be here to talk about this extremely important and timely question. And all of us, as we dedicate ourselves to the continued advocacy of representational government and utilization in an anticipatory way of technology for its benefit. And let us give our amazing panelists a round of applause. Thank you so much.